uh, welcome to the super specific lecture. My name is Marcos Javier Burjocaso. I'm a member of the Latin Edition at Kekesh. And uh, we're going to talk today about the current concept in retro retropathy of prematurity. We we'll start with the definition of the disease here. So first thing we have to know is a complex disease. It's not something uh, very easy as to forward. And uh, one of the, I try to highlight the, the key topics uh, for you to know exactly what is uh, important to that because we're going to assess all of information during this lecture. So it's a complex disease. It's initiated in part by the lack of uh, complete normal vascularization in premature infants. There is the absence the absence of retinal vessels in the person with mature retina can result in retinal ischemia. And retinal ischemia, they will uh, lead to the release of the growth factors that makes an uh, um, abnormal uh, vascular growth. The vessels, they will proliferate into the vitreous cavity and the border between the vascular and the vascular retina here. And what's going to happen, the end stage of the disease, that they get attraction, the retina get detached, and the vision is lost. So, with whole, whole is the uh, whole frequency is the problem we are assessing. It's not frequent. So here in USA, it's about 1,100, 1,500 uh, 1, uh, kids treated per year. So it's not frequent. But in uh, um, parts of the world, the world is just limited. Up to now, these kids, because they were perturbed at the couple of diseases, they usually die. But now, all these areas, they began to have better uh, postnatal and perinatal care. So these kids, they will survive. And the problem is, uh, there is an increase in the incidence of rare OP in these phases. Why? First of all, because they have more kids. And the second, because they are taking care of these kids. Thus, these kids, they will survive, and they will have more chances to present their disease. The problem is, the, the problem is there is a lack between the success treating the premature care doing uh, care in, in uh, neonatal ICU units and don't diagnose and treat successfully the ROP here. Here in this, you see, for instance, this is the prenatal um, uh, borns in uh, countries like Europe, for instance, 5.5. Uh, USA, for instance, is uh, about 10. And in some areas of the Africa, it's on 18, 19. So the more kids you have with the prenatal case, the more chances you have to have aerobic. Let's speak about something about the pathophysiology of this disease. So in a normal eye, the retinal vasculature begins at the, between 14 and 16 weeks, and it's tendex from the optic disc to the peripheral of the retina. So as the kids grow up, the, the vasculature of the retina gets completed around, or the nasal area, around uh, 36 weeks, and on the temporary around 40 weeks. So most, mostly at the end of the uh, delivery, usually the normal delivery of the kid, usually this, uh, the, the retina is co co completely perfected. There is something you have to put in the one idea is very important in this topic here. When you have a peripheral disease, you have a better disease. Why? Because the cause is how many tissues involved into the disease. So you have more posterior disease, you have more tissue generating a uh, growth factor, so the chances to have a worse outcome are much better, okay? So the more peripheral disease, the better. The more central, the worse. So we distinguish uh, two, uh, two phases, just to make it a little bit uh, more academic here. Phase one, is, it happens before 30 we uh, 31 weeks. The, this, the kids get born, and because it's possible to high um, oxygen, so the vascular development stops. They don't continue like a normal way, okay? And then there's a decrease on the growth factors. At the BGF and uh, insulin growth factor one, they decrease it in the blood here. But all this tissue they get without blood, they will react. And react increasing these vascular factors. The prime is when you increase this vascular factor, there is the second phase or the vasoprotective phase. When you increase the vascular factor, what happens to the kid is they get uh, abnormal growth of the vessels. And these vessels don't only grow to the retina, also grow to the vitus, as you say. So, usually the progression starts from early progression to late progression. So, stage one to stage five. Or regress, if the condition is treated for the kid, we will regress. So, this is the, the, the normal follow up of the disease. As is here, if you have a here and the kid was born uh, pre uh, pre uh, pre premature, 
So they will be exposed to uh, high levels of oxygen here for, for the, the breathing natural maturity of the lungs here. And if the kids get born and the, the, the tank have to be, but they have ill diseases like sepsis or they need prostate fusion or they have some um, neurological or lung issues, they will need more supplemental oxygen and so on. So it can cause uh, this disease in kids that they, they are born, not prematurely, but uh, on, the, on, the, on the normal way. Okay? So what happened here is this incomplete material vascularity here. In the phase one, you will see the vessels, the vessels stops at the stage of the of the perfusion uh, of the or the, as a stage of the of the retina here, and this will cause the delayed uh, perfusion of the of these vessels here. Okay, it could happen in stage one, stage two. In stage two, in the second phase, which is a post phase that you have growth factors growing over, you have this vessel perfusion in the edge of the retina here, and the is the stage of this disease is when you have tractions, the retina get detached, and the vision completely lost. Which is a natural cause of disease. Most of the kids they're going to have this uh, disease. It's my disease, and they don't need any treatment at all. So 85 of the age will spontaneously release. Okay. But as you say here, progression is going from the early stages to the later stages, if nothing can be done. Okay. We need to treat between seven to ten percent of the eyes here. So there is a percentage of kids, small percentage that these kids is going to be I will Later on, we are aware why we need to treat these kids and why they have to be fast treating these kids. But all these diseases, they can cause 400 to 600 kids legally blind in the USA, even doing the things on a right way. It means even the skill uh, is going on a right way and the treatment is going on a right, on, on a right way, some kids, unfortunately, they will lose the vision because of complications for the ROP. These are the late consequences of ROP in grown up. So with the kids, they regress it. Everything goes to normal? No. These kids, they have more myopia. They have aninocetopia, they have amblyopia, estrabismos, have cataract and glaucoma. Also, they have macular pigment, retinal tears, and one of the most important things that happen in adults is retinal detachment. These kids are at risk to have retinal detachments and difficult to fit. Why? Because they have a more alliance between the, the, the retina and the nucleus. So, the kinyanosis classification of this disease, we saw that International Coefficient of, of Retinal Prematurity here, the crop. Okay? So this is the how we grade these kids. It's very important to know this classification because all we want to speak about the kids, it's based on tumor. So the morphology, we rate the, the, the disease using the morphology of what we see in the patient. So the morphology of the vasoprotein disease. We're going to see which is the location of the disease. We're going to see how many uh, area of the retina is, is affected here. Also, we state, look at the morphological features of the, of the, of the disease, we state it, and then we, it's very important to assess the patient has plus disease or not, because it have a, a therapeutic implication for that. So, regarding location, there is three zones, zone one, zone two, and zone three. So the first two zones are concentric to the optics. So they are circles, okay? Also, you're now in the graphic here. And then zone three is the last area, which is only temporal to the, to, to, to the eye, as you see here. See? Zone one, zone two, and zone three. We'll discuss later on about that. But the key test is always centered on the optics. The definition of uh, zone one is a circle center of the optic disc, and you have the radius of double the, the distance between the optic disc and the macula. That's a very important uh, definition, okay? Also, the second one, it's a circle, center of the disc, and it goes to the oral serrato, the nasal side. And the zone three is this terminal area of the retina, is only on the temporal side, okay? But now, there is a new, okay, but I put the graphics you see in the books. But this is new, it's uh, 2021. This is a new classification, and the new classification highlights this area here. They call it the zone two posterior. Why? Because zone two posterior, okay, tends to behave as a zone one disease. So probably the patient that have zone two posterior, we need to follow as a zone one. Okay, this is the only change. There's another change of terminology, we'll speak about that. But look at it, it's quite different, it's, it's quite the same. But you have to put that into your mind, okay? 
So about the staging, it means the formology, morphology of we see into the eye here, the stage zero, which is my two parts twice a retina. Okay, this is based no disease. Stage one is lying. Are you trying to highlight the, the, the walls you, you need to remember? Like it's a line. It is a line. It's a line between the vascularized retina and the vascularized retina here. Okay? Stage two is a ridge. It's a line that grows and grows. So they have to have height and white. Okay? Stage three is when the things get worse. Okay, so we have extra retina fibrous proliferation. At the edge of the retina, the, 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 the border between the vascularized and non-vascularized retina, you have vessels growing and growing up to the vitus cavity. Okay? More advanced the stages is stage 4A, which is they have extra foveal retinal detachment, and stage 4B is a foveal retinal detachment. And finally, the last stage, when there's things go really wrong, is a total retinal detachment, as you see here. Okay? Clear? I have one comment. Yeah. For the, I'm Fadwa Al Anta, uh, medical retinal consultant. Yeah. The oncology medical. One uh, practical point in uh, knowing the zones, if you, while examining, when you uh, look at the nasal retina, if it's fully vascularized, you know that you're into stage, into zone three, because you won't be able to imagine these circles. So if still the nasal retina is not fully vascularized, you're still into zone two. If it's fully vascular, vascularized, you know that the remnant is the crescent, temporal crescent, so the, 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 the uh, vascularization has reached zone three already. So that's a practical point to consider when, uh, while you're we examining. Thank you. So one thing we have to know also, you have, have different stages in the same eye, as you see here. This patient has a stage three disease here. Okay, they have nervous over the, uh, the ridge, and they have a ridge here. And usually, we classify the eye at the worst stage we can see for the eye here. But as a, you have to note all the, uh, all in, in the, your graph, you have to know all the changes you have in the, in the retina here. But we classify and we make therapeutic decisions thinking which is the worst state we can find into the eye here, okay? <laughs> also, let's see, here is an example, and here it's about stage two and stage three. Another important point, and difficult to know because uh, when you have plus disease, it means probably you have to treat the patient. So it's very important to know if the patient has a plus disease or you have a pre plus disease. This is also quite new. So you have plus disease, you have deletion of the vessels, usually mostly the veins. You got tortuosity on the arteries here, less than two quadrants. So it means any patient, they have some plus features, but doesn't mean they go more than two quadrants here, we have a pre plus disease. Okay. If we have a patient with plus disease, it means they have this uh, is because it's compliant with this rule. They have more two or more quadrants of tortuosity of the vessels or deletion of the vascular uh, of the eyes here because uh, your pupil doesn't control very well also, or they have vitreous case here. So how we use all this classification to rate a patient? So this is an example here. Can you see? There's a line here. Okay? And we're thinking about it is zone one or zone two. Okay, if you check here the circle, okay, the circle of the radius of the macula, it goes like here. So the pathology is inside zone one. So as we say, we classify tickets at the worst. Uh, so we, it's a patient with a zone one, stage one plus disease. Why plus? Because look at the vessels here. Dilated, dilated, dilated. So it have more than two quadrants here, so they take one plus disease. Okay? This is a special type of, uh, of uh, retinopathy prominent here because aggressive rob. You will sign in your books as uh, aggressive posterior rob. But now they change the name because uh, it could be posterior, but it could be more also anterior. So that's the way they remove the P from the upper, they call it upper. Now it's going to be a prop. It's aggressive prop. It's a patient that has zone one disease with a stage rate, but flat. What's important about this disease? They can present early in the course and also they don't follow the, non, the, namura, the, the, the natural way of uh, zone one, zone two, zone three. So the, you have to be aware of that because this is a very fast disease and it causes very bad outcomes. This uh, disease progressed very, very, very fast to stage four, stage five. 
So it's important to cut all this uh, uh, all, all this information mine when you're screening the kids because you can find a kid with that, and it's going to be followed very closely because they they change to be uh, going to the end stage disease very fast. Okay, so usually they have this characteristics. It's a posterior area zone one with a stated flat and massive plus disease. They have four warrants of plus disease here. Okay. There is something you want to try, okay? If there is an the American Academy, they have a, like a, a, a software. You can go with your navigator here. And the time you can be able to give you some cases, is make a report time. And you can get some cases, you can play over, and you can be able to rate your cases. And also, you play with staging, and there's blood, nose blood disease, and we hold you to this patient. I think it's really interesting, and I find it a really, um, um, informative to do it here. So I advise you if you have the chance to do it. Even if you are going to do uh, retina or you're going to do pediatrics, I think it's a really uh, nice thing to do. Okay, let's go for skin recommendations. Okay, so skin recommendations, you will see that different countries have different skin recommendations according to the healthcare, the kind of kids they have, and also probably because of race involved here. So I want to speak about the, uh, the skin recommendation of USA. Is the one you want to find in your manual from American Academy of Ophthalmology? But I will make some comments also just to show you that screen could be different in different areas here. Okay. So all infants with a weight less than 150 kilograms, okay, or they have 30 weeks or less, needs to be screened. In Saudi Arabia, it's 32 weeks. Okay. And all kids they have more weight. But they have unstable kinetic pulse, they have infection, they have uh, the, like a neurological damage, they have um, problems during the, the, the postnatal age, they need to be screened also. Even if they are with more weight and they have more advanced uh, the age of, the, of, of, of delivery, okay? So these are to show you three different countries with different, uh, yeah, this minimal difference, but this difference there, so for instance, uh, in New Zealand, for instance, they screen uh, kids with uh, 125 kilos. Here in Saudi Arabia, they screen, the, the limit is 1,500 1, 1, 1, uh, grams, okay? And also United Kingdom also is different, okay? Just to show you that if you can't find information, you can check it another book, you'll find different. When you have to screen the kids? First examination have to be four weeks postnatal, okay? Okay, 31 weeks. Yeah, yeah, so the 31 weeks is the, 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 the number you have to put in your mind here, okay? And also, there's an algorithm, but this creates some controversy here. You will see about here about the Windrop algorithm here. It's a, an algorithm that try to, to be a more um, a specific, that to get what kids they are intended to have radio prematurely here. It's based on the weight loss and the, the, uh, the GP1 serum uh, levels of the patient. So you put your the, your data into the, the, the web page and they give you if the kids have high risk or low risk. Well, the, the funny thing is when these people try this algorithm in different parts of the world, it depends on the part of the world, you have more chances or less chances to succeed. So you see in Sweden and US, they have 100 cell sensitivity. But look at that for say Taiwan here, it's 64, okay? And also, for instance, in India, there's a study here where they take it here, it's 90. It means, it depends on the area of the world you are seeing here, maybe this algorithm doesn't work. Why? Because probably there is racist, and also there is uh, like a different ICU, uh, neonatal ICU protocols here. That would change a lot of things. So I think you got to take the, the, the numbers and think this is uh, like a, the got to, okay? So it could change. So we screen the kit. Okay, now how we follow the kid? But the answer is we follow the kid very closely. I will show you right now here. So the follow-up is based on severity of the disease. We have a severe disease, we need to, the, 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 to follow the kid closely. If we have not so severe disease, we can be a little bit more spaced on the visit here. But the rule is, as most posterior the disease, okay, more frequent follow-up. So which kids we have to follow in one week or less? So all kids with immature vasculation and without NOP. All kids that have stage one, stage two NOP in zone one, posterior. And kids that have stage three NOP in posterior zone two. Okay, that's why the new one they told you because posterior zone two in stage three it is to behave as a as a as a zone one. 
That's why you need to follow this script closely. Okay, why? Because the chances to have bad outcomes is higher. Okay? And also, if you suspicious or you have suspicion or you can affirm the patient have uh, the aggressive uh, ROP. One, two weeks, you have immature uh, vascularization in posterior zone two without ROP. Or you have stage two ROP in zone two, or you have regression in zone one. Two weeks for the kids that have immature vascularization in zone two and no ROP. Stage one ROP in zone two, or immature regression in zone two. And two to three weeks in the kids that have stage one or two in zone three, or they have regression. Okay, so as Posterior is the disease we follow much closely. This is a graphic illustrating here. Look at this zone one. You have to see the heat uh, less than one week most of the times. So when we stop scaling the kids, so it is a complete vascularization without zone one so ROP, we can stop the follow up. Okay? Or there is full retinal vascularization if you use anti BGF. Or you have kids with a menstrual age of 40 weeks or, or older, and they don't have no type 1 disease. And lastly, if there is complete regression of the, of the ROP, as long as there is no abnormal tissue. So there is no tissue, you have to follow the kid. And this is also the discrimination criteria of the screening, also is different in different countries. Let's speak about the telemedicine here because what is, what is happening right now is that there is a lack uh, of uh, ROP experts in the world. So you cannot all have ROP experts in all ICUs in the countries here. So there is a new new trend to, to use, use telemedicine for this kit. It means you will concentrate the, the, the images taken by different systems in few experts. So the few they have also the knowledge to follow the kids and there is, uh, for instance, these telemedicine models. It works very well, but the problem is it's expensive. You have to buy a camera here. So every ICU has to have a camera here. Could be living by ophthalmologists or could be living by dietitians. This is one of the examples. There is some machines here. This is the one we use at uh, KTS. This is a red cam. So this is a camera. You put the lens here, and you can get these nice images here. So why to photo document the kit? It's important because first, you have to be objective. Second thing, you have to do longitudinal comparison of the kid. You can also have a second opinion. You can send the pictures to a colleague that you have their opinion about that. You can also evaluate the response of the treatment, and also it's good for teaching, and also to counsel in the, the, the family also. And also, you can do it uh, for medical legal protection is important too, okay? And this uh, paper recently published by uh, the, the Saudi Arabia group uh, by uh, Dr. Sayar Ambro, Gandhi, uh, Marwan, Fahad Alakel, Kabirat, and Suleiman about what they are doing right now in our hospital. There's 20 uh, neonatal ICUs. They send the pictures to the system, and the experts are evaluating the system. They are giving advice about how to manage the thing. Okay? It's very uh, recent paper. You can read it in the in the, in, the web, in the web. Okay, so which different diagnosis you have to do, do, do this, in this disease? So which disease can be similar to that? So if this every disease of the kid with the clinical history is very easy to know if the patient has a of prematurity here because few things can cause that thing. But we are dealing with kids that have the Parkinson disease. So they have retinal detachment, they have, so it could be different diseases also. So usually the diagnosis, different diagnosis is very easy, okay, at the early stage of the disease. And it's really difficult when you have more advanced disease. Most important thing, you have put also in the clinical history, is if you have past medical history of prematurity care. And also this is not true only for kids. Because this patient, they will grow, they have 25 years old, and they can have a retinal detachment. And you have a patient with a retinal detachment 25 years old, and it has a previous history of prematurity, you need to deal, you are dealing with a difficult surgery. Because the, there's a normal address of the retina, you have to behave different in these cases. So this is the different uh, events you can have. So retinal ischemia, most of the disease is fever, fever, fever. You see it all the time because it's very similar to that. Difference between fever, fever is a genetic disease, and second doesn't have with this story of prematurity here. There's another uh, uh, disease like in terms of pimenti or second baby syndrome, you have retinal ischemia or you have a subretinal solution, it could be a cause disease. But most of the times, put in your mind is fever is the most 
mimic uh, disease we are going to face. Prevention. We can prevent these, uh, these things to happen. We try. Okay. So we know that supplemental oxygen factor during the preterm or during the, the postterm post delivery here could be a major leading factor. And then there was people who tried to, uh, to, to decrease the supplemental oxygen for these kids. But we realized we are not very effective uh, decreasing the rot because these kids die. The problem is if you decrease the oxygen for these kids, the event of neurological and death of the kids, it gets higher. That's the reason they don't go this way. So the best way to prevent it is to prevent prematurity here. With be better prenatal, perinatal, and postnatal care, you can be able not to have these kids, and probably you don't have to have the disease also. Okay? It's very important also, it's very important to say more and more that postnatal care is key, is one of the areas we can influence not to have this kid because the, the prenatal and perinatal care. You cannot get too much. You have a high risk uh, pregnancy, you're going to have a, pre uh, um, a preborn kid. But if you have a postnatal care, it means infections, hemorrhages, uh, different things. It could, if we cannot be able to stop these diseases to get worse, probably we're going to reduce the candidates to be able to have retinal pre prematurity. So, about treatment, okay? So, there is also, you will see changes. If you will read the books and they are a little old, you will see this, say they call it threshold, pre threshold. This all, uh, you have to put it right now, that this is the most recent names. So, type 1 ROP or treatment warrant ROP, we call the things that need to be treated. Okay? So, any zone 1 disease with plus disease need to be treated. Okay? Any zone 1 state 3 without plus disease need to be treated. It means you have vessels. In zone one, in the area, even though you have plus disease, you need to treat the skin, okay? Or you have zone two with the stage two or three with plus disease. So as you see, it's very important to the to to determine the kids has plus the plus uh, disease or not, because the decision to treat is going to be based on that, okay? Also, if you need you want to treat the kid, you want to treat the kid fast. Don't delay the, the, the treatment for the kid because you will be in trouble, okay? So. Treatment has to be done in less than two hours. So type two ROP, they need close follow up. Why? It means it's not needed treatment, but maybe we need it very soon. Okay. So any kid with zone one disease without plus disease need to be close follow up. Close follow up. Any kid with zone uh, zone two stage two with no plus disease, only one quarter, the pre plus disease, they need to be followed closely. Any kid with stage three also, okay, without plus disease, need to be followed. This is a combination of basis that we study will speak it in a in a moment here, which is the the, the, the every treatment for retro the criteria. Okay. So if you evaluate these kids, as the, our colleague says, it is one thing we have to put in your mind. So most important thing is these two questions. There is plus disease or not? Because there is a plus disease, there is a huge chance you want to treat the kid. So if there is plus disease, you need to treat the kid. Okay? And if the area, the most affected area, is in zone one or is in zone two, because they have therapeutic implications. Depending on which area you're going to be, probably you would choose one treatment or the other one. Okay? Look at the progress of the disease. This is the ROP stage with time, and this is the progress of the disease. At the early stages, it doesn't progress for so fast. But the later stages from three, four, five is super fast. That's why we don't need to delay the therapy. If we go for treatment, we need to treat and we need to treat fast. Okay? Also, this is not a PRP for a diabetic patient. You need to treat in one session, okay? Because the disease progresses very fast. So this is an example of a treatment here, you see, an area here, the ridge, and this is the vascular retina. So first, they treat from the oral serrata to the middle of the eye. Now, usually, then, when you go here, you increase the power to treat the bridge. That's a nice treatment. Look at this treatment here. What happened? We treat the physiological retina, or we skip the ischemic retina. Okay, this is a bad treatment. Okay, this is a, the, the thing you don't have to do. Okay, so the thing is, we need to treat. We need to do it first well, and you do it fast. Because the problem with laser, Mostly you only want one shot. You make it wrong, you'll be in trouble. Okay? So with clinical trials, it's based on that because the information we did right now is based on clinical trials. 
Software trial is a cryo, cry, the cryo here. The cryo the cryo trial was good for patients that have this disease, but the problem with the cryo is cannot treat the posterior lesion because the cryo doesn't go posterior here. So the results in posterior lesions are not good with cryo here. And also there was more retinal dragging and there was a lot of consequences here. But before that we don't have nothing, so that's all what we do. But uh, really late in the uh, in a few years we have some works working. Instead of using cryo, you use a laser. With laser, you have better outcomes. It has less myopia, and there's not so much flattening of the retina. So there was the standard of care until a few years ago. Okay. So this patient, you have, uh, you, you have the stage uh, 3 plus, you treat it with laser. Okay. But then it comes this uh, ex uh, early uh, treatment for uh, ROB, which is the, the, one of the main, uh, the main, uh, main state of, of, of papers you have in, the, in this disease here. And they classify the patient in high risk or low risk preferential. So they choose exactly the kids who were in the border to see which patient they need to be followed and this will increase it. And this corresponds to type one and type two ROP. So when you see about here about threshold or pre-threshold, you will think about exactly the same terminology here. But now we call it type one, type two. So what we know right now is kids who have type, uh, type one ROP, they need to be treated. They do better if they're treated. Kids with type 2 ROP, they can be followed closely, but can be followed because maybe we'll spare the laser for the kid, okay? So the laser recommendation we do right now is based on the findings of the uh, um, early uh, treatment for ROP. And this is the uh, results. See, uh, the, the clinical trials, if you check with this successful rate of, of the laser, okay, you will see that in the first years, it's quite successful here. And then with the big rope and rainbow, we will speak in a moment with anti-BGF, this is the uh, the success rate is lower. But why? Because in non clinical trials, we're going to com compare peaches with uh, watermelons. Okay? If you rate success in a clinical trial different, you will find different things. So the criteria of success with B drop and rainbow okay, was different than the one you used for A drop. Okay? So the thing is, if you find different, you're going to find differences here. So you see, laser was very good in this area, and it's going to be not so good when you speak about anti BGF. So, which is the other tool we have here? We have, we know the disease, when the vasodilatory disease, there is a high secretion of vasodilatory growth factor. So we block it, if we have drugs that are blockaded here, maybe it will work in this case, and this is the case. So this is another mainstay paper we have to, about ROP, is a big drop. So it was a, a, a randomized clinical trial, and they compared laser, which is the gold standard, to intravital devocizumab, devocizumab de avastin, okay? So, in kids with the zone one or zone two posterior stage three plus. Okay, so we compare which is better, laser or intermittent injections. And we find that if you have posterior disease, okay, it means zone one disease, it's much better to use the bacithumab. Okay? If you have zone two posterior, okay, there's no statistical significance. Okay, this is what the, the study says. So it seems the recommendation is to use anti-BGF injections in patients with a posterior disease. There's another study, the study Rainbow. It's made with ranithumab with lutentis, okay? And it compared also laser two doses of ranithumab in type 1 ROP here. And the, the funny thing is they find something a little bit different, but it's better for us also, because ranithumab was superior in all results, okay? In all anatomical modality. It doesn't matter if it's uh, kind of... Uh, of if you have zone one, zone two, it was superior to use ranithumab to use laser, okay? And also, there is a new policy, recent policy, 2021, an open level station, because there was a, a, a concern if the, what happened to these kids if we do, do intermittent injections of the eye here, which happened because BGF is, a, is something we need our body to develop here. So maybe we have new neurodevelopment development problems on all these things, but the ranithumab, in these kids, they follow two years, they have less myopia because they don't laser for the kids, and also they don't have any neurodevelopmental damage here. So it seems it's quite safe. But kind of safe right now because it's, there's not so much experience to anti BGF. So if we compare laser and anti BGF, I will give you advantages and disadvantages of, of uh, different, um, uh, different uh, tools. So it seems that if we talk about success rate, it's much easier. If you have posterior disease, zone 1 disease, better to anti -BGF. If you have zone 2 disease, equal could be a, the, the, the outcome could be the same. 
okay? If you think about side complications and uh, surgical difficulty, it's better to do intravitreal injections. Why? Because laser needs a training. It's not easy to do it. And if you fail to do the kit at the now, maybe in two weeks you will have a problem, okay? So, and TBGF, it's a more, it's not so much user dependent. Laser, you have to have more experience to get a, 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 a better outcome here. What's the problem with uh, uh, anti -BGF? Because it seems the tool works for everything, but they have more recurrences. It's been demonstrated that if you treat with the patient with anti -BGF, you can have late recurrences. So it means that you have a uh, patient treated with anti -BGF, you need to follow the patient long time, more than the laser. Laser recurrence is very mild. But if they regress, they don't go back. But you can have late recurrences with anti -BGF. That's why there's something we have to be advantages and disadvantages, okay? If we think about visual field and refraction, because you are going to do less on the periphery, there will be no myopia. Okay, so probably the, the, the refraction outcome and the visual field per service is much better with anti -BGF. Also, retinal detaching, we don't know right now, but it's seen some, um, the, um, they, it's begun to, 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 to build up some, um, some, some knowledge that, that probably if you do anti -BGF, you have more chance to have retinal detaching. Okay, also, we don't know exactly because we don't use so many for so many times the kids with anti -BGF. So let's see that probably and thinking about long term effects in the uh, systemic or offer effects, probably it's better to use laser for the kids. But in summary, anti -BGF is more or less good for any kind of disease, but you have to be uh, careful about the follow up. It means if you treat with your anti -BGF, you have to follow up longer. Why? Because this regression, okay, they have their reactivation. One word into that here, so there's something if you have to, if you read the studies about that, this difference between, which is recurrence and which is persistence here. Because a recurrence is a success of the treatment, okay? So you treat the patient and they record. Why? Because anti they they don't stay forever until they are here, okay? But persistence means lack of effect, so it's a treatment failure here. So you see, you treat the treatment here, you either you got your laser, and you follow the kit one month. If this kit persists, it means a treatment failure. If the kids record and they go back again, it's a recurrence here. And this is an implication of the kind of treatment you're going to do for the kit also, okay? Because you can combine treatments too. Few words about vitoretinal surgery, okay, in this kit. So vitoretinal surgery is what we offer for the kids if they are stage four or stage five, okay? Uh, it's better outcomes, as you may can imagine here. If you have a stage four disease than a stage five here, the disease. The treatment that the, for stage four probably is lens uh, spine bar spine but the prime is sometimes it's Ah, it's very crowded here. It's very difficult to find this place uh, for, for, to, to, for the maneuvers. I will show you in a moment some graphics about that. So the problem is keep, keep in your mind, if you treat early the retinal detachment, you have more chances to flatten the retina. If you have well, operating in stage five, you have more difficulty here. Well, probably you have to remove the lens for, for this kid. Why? We are also in a, in a graphic here. So there are complex cases, and the outcomes are very bad. But with sometimes both eyes are affected here, so you have to do it, okay? You try to do the minimal surgery needed, okay? So you don't want to peel all the membranes, you don't want to complete the fracture, the fracture, the retina complete, no. You want to release the traction, I will show you in a graphic here. So how successful is the surgery? So reattachment rates for stage four eyes between 74 and 95. So most of the kids, they do well with surgery. Stage uh, four B means with foveal movement, a little bit lower, success was more or less the same. The problem case with a stage five, which is a success rate is only 22 to 48. And we're talking about anatomical success rates, not uh, functional success rates. That's why in some countries, they stop operating kids with a stage five, because success rate is very low. It's more important to know, for the will be with the retinal side, the stage are really high in this case. If you dissect and you create a break, halas, eyes lost. Because PDR will come, they will let they will detach it, you lose the eye. So this is not a disease surgery at all. Yes, <coughs> or the opposite way, okay? And probably I will tell you that you need to be sub specialist on disease because for today we don't have so many cases. So the thing is, it's better to concentrate these cases in few people. They can be able to do these cases. So first of all, they will have more training. Second, they have offered better chances to flatten the retina. If everybody is doing these kids, the prognosis is very poor. 
So it's better to concentrate the, the few cases gravity in the small specialists so they can build up the skills and ability to, need to manage these kids, okay? And also, it's very important to use now with the petrachromy small calipers. They used to 25, 27, I didn't say it before, but better use 25 because it's a good compromise with the, 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 the thickness of the instruments here and also the, 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 the small caliper of the, of the egg here. Why this, this site is so important? Because we deal with four axon taxes here. There is, first of all, this the rich here, so the well is that grand heat. Grand heat means this, a membrane of the vitreous coming one side to the other side of the ridge. Also, there is another vector of traction from the ridge to the eye wall. There is a third one from posterior to anterior, going to the periphery, the vitreous base, and now goes to the other Okay, This is exactly how we feel here. So you need to peel all these peripherals to let the retina relax by themselves and apply by themselves. And that without creating a break. This is a anatomical, uh, this is a pathology image here. Do you know exactly what's happened to this kid? Look at the retinas, totally touched down for sitting in a tissue here. This is what happens to this kid, okay? So it's a difficult surgery, and better not to do it. So the key is to treat early, treat well, so we don't have these advanced cases. See, there's a different images here, because these patients, the they, they disease is going to uh, used to be like a, Fibro, fibro, um, tretolental uh, fibroporization here because this white is here. So first thing you have to do is open this this uh, tissue here just to see where's the retina. Then you begin to liberate the retina here slowly with the section use forceps and scissors. And the idea is to liberate the center of the retina so the retina will, will fall down by itself without creating a break. If you create a break, game over. Okay. And this is a uh, to all we spoke about that, it's a summary of the treatment here. As you see here, this is a disease that is needs by somebody who's had a lot of skills and also interested to do that. It's not for everyone. But this is a disease that is really important to do it on the right way. Why? First of all, because the kids that don't treat in the right way is it means I is going to be lost. Okay. And the second thing is I think it's worth as a as the country becomes better and better, okay, we're going to kind of be able to offer more for these kids, okay? So this is more or less all the tools, anti-VGF, anti vitectomy, vitectomy, and laser, okay? And thanks for your attention. Any questions? <laughs> right in time. Thank you, Doctor, for this uh, very nice informative lecture. Uh, Doctor Mosa from uh, King of the in the South. One thing I, I notice difficulty is uh, cases that are stage three uh, with the fibrovascular proliferation and let's say mild uh, tenting of the retina but not complete detachment. Like stage four A is a detachment from the ridge to peripheral. These are not detached yet, but they are stage three. And we know if we treat them, most likely they will contract and cause a detachment, maybe stage four A. Some other stage three, they are uh, just uh, new vascularization of the ridge without fibrosis and just pain stage three, and they, we, I, I know that if I treat them, it will just melt away and disappear. So there is an area in, gray, in stage three, kind of a broad space, yani, stage one is clear, stage two is very clear, stage three is, is, a, is a lot of clinical finding. Yeah, so it's, I, I totally agree with that. The, the thing is, if you, for instance, read the papers about the uh, published here, you see that the people that have um, higher success rate in retinal detachment, especially in this uh, stage four A case, Probably this is the patient you want to see. Many of these patients they do this on the right way, probably going to not to detect. Okay. The prime is your peripheral detachment. You can be able to laser because you, you do scaling in the tissue here, okay. you do laser the retina. Yeah. Maybe you can keep an average here. So probably if you check the, the literature here, you get these special cases, the species with state for A. There was a higher success rate. Yeah. But maybe, as you say, maybe this kid did not need to operate it, treat it aggressively with laser. Maybe you will succeed about that. But the problem is, this is a case you have, yeah. and you have a retinal detachment. It's, it's a state for uh, A, you like it or not. The thing is, I totally agree with your comment, because um, if you operate these kids, okay, um, it's a very difficult thing. It's not easy to operate a kid so small with the big lens here. Sometimes, with the surgery, you can damage more your fix here. As you say, you try to release the, the traction of the retina, but you create a break, fast, game over. Or also, you can touch the lens with the surgery also. 
So I think that, the, honestly, if you have experience, you can be a little more aggressive with the laser, but you have to yeah. close uh, the, uh, the, the, the eyes. Some would suggest to doing the scleral buckle. Like buckle yeah, buckle, yeah. A, it, a, it's a been described, but if you check the literature, this, they yeah. aren't doing that anymore. Yes. Okay, so the thing is, it's been discovered, and I remember one case I saw in Spain. It's a, he, he grew up, and he kept scale buckle, and the scale buckle creates a problem because they contract the retina, they, 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 they stop to grow because they have a scale buckle. Yeah. Well, the, the, the people who advocate for scale buckle, they advocate also to cut the buckle it, after a yeah. few months. Yeah, but uh, yeah, if you look at here, you create a problem. This is what happened to this patient. Uh, honestly, I think if it, the problem is, um, uh, also, this it's, it's a lecture. We, we, there is a lot of things to uh, to to go into that because also it depends of the races. It seems some some genetic some races can be more aggressive than some other races here. That's why if you check out the results, it's not about the skills and ability of the surgeon. It's which kind of patient you are dealing on. Because for instance, in India, they are not successful. They are not successful like for instance in US. You see the patient in US, you see they are talking about macular folks, but. I think that probably these kids, some of them operated very early in the course of the disease because medical legal reason people are getting afraid because some of the kids can go wrong. Yeah. So if you don't operate the kid, it will tell you no. You will let the kid get blind. So that's probably some of the signs get a bit, little more aggressive than you have here. Yeah. Here probably we don't have the same, the same issue. And maybe you can more chances to do your laser before going for, for worse. But uh, this is the tool we have right now. I will get compared to surgery. But it's clear, you see the literature, it depends on the area where you get born, the things go better or worse. So I think one of the most interesting factors when you review this, I, I will advise for the residents, go to the AEO uh, and play with that, because it's really fun, and you will probably all these Information I'm giving to you, you are not going to get. But you pick it as a game, you will like it a lot, and you will be into into this pathology here. And it's very well designed. It. Uh, Suleiman told me he was working with the the big one because there was a big file made by by Paul Chang about that, and he was a lot of images to classify here. There's only 20 cases, but it's good to to know because probably you will practice at the same time you see here. And this is something which changing very very fast. Thanks God, we all can be able to have these uh, premature kids. And probably in Europe, because they don't have so many borns right now, they have this prematurity too. It depends on the, of the country. The numbers are different. I think Saudi Arabia, it's, it's, it has a huge natality up to now. So probably it's something which will be more interesting to do it. And I think also telemedicine, and probably artificial, artificial intelligence, there's, about, there's a lot of people working into that, <laughs> will change a lot the, 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 the profile of these kids. But finally, we need somebody who do the research. So, yes, yes. So, yeah, but I think that. But I think that some of the success they are doing anti GF right now is because anti GF is much easier. But do laser. Laser is much complicated. I mean, it's easy to know we do laser in the kids. Now to do this with small eyes, I try to do laser in this kids. It's not that easy the same. You can damage very easily the lens, you can do a lot of damage and you also give that an example of a failure of the treatment. You can make it wrong, okay? Also I think it's a, something that uh, it's a, probably is going to work here, and that's one of the things that the anti vgf is pushing as the first option. Is because you don't need training. You, to inject the eye, we know how to do it right now. Any questions? Nobody. So, floor is yours. Thank you.